Hey, what's up, guys? Today, I sat down with Ivan Anastasov, who is a professor of biology here at San Francisco State University. His research specializes in the biology of vision and comparative retinal neurophysiology. All in all, it was a really fun conversation that I had with Ivan, and I'm really excited to share it with you guys. If there's any feedback you guys would like to share with me, I'd love to hear what you guys think in the comments. And without further ado, here is Atlas. O22, Ivan Anastasov. Device some more of your meditation. For it gives our inspiration. Professor Anastasov, thanks so much for being on today. Sure, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. First question I had was in regards to your approach to research. Um, curious if there are any scientists of the past that have inspired your approach to research or maybe even your pursuit of higher education early on. Wow, sure. It's a nice question to start with. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I'd probably say that that the biggest direct influence uh, on, on just my career path and my research have been um, my mentors all through undergraduate and graduate school and, and uh, as a postdoc. Um, and so I had a, a, a very supportive group of professors uh, where I went to school was in college uh, in New York at the City University of New York, uh, Hunter College, which is a wonderful place. I highly recommend that students go there. Um, and so, you know, there I had a, an encounter with a professor just sort of randomly with his graduate student who was teaching one of the classes and, and I was interested in research. So he said, well, you know, we, we're always looking for help in the lab. Why don't you come by? Um, and then from that point on, I, I was kind of hooked. Mm -hmm. um, I sort of, in a way, I couldn't believe that they let me work with the equipment with with and they uh, gave me responsibility but um, it was one of those moments that I uh, that really changed things um, and then um, that sort of continued through graduate school uh, and through through postdoc um, I had the um, I had the uh, uh, privilege of, of being uh, mentored in graduate school by uh, by a professor who was very um, uh, sort of very sort of kind person, very knowledgeable, but just somebody who really encouraged mm. uh, their students to to sort of to get to pursue their interests and get independent. So his name was um, is Dr. Richard Chapel. and so we often uh, worked together with another. Um, um, sort of collaborator who was um, actually uh, he's passed away since his name is Dr. Harris Rips but um, um, it was really remarkable to learn how things were done when he started which was in the 1950s and mm -hmm. 60s um, and to hear sort of both of them talk about some of the science that was done a long, long time ago. And a lot of times in science, which is what I do, I'm a biologist, you tend to get uh, focused on what's the newest thing, what's the latest discovery, what's the, the, the newest, flashiest paper. When I think a lot of really interesting things um, it can be found if you look back, really far back in the literature. And so, you know, people had great ideas a long time ago, and sometimes they just didn't have a way to answer a particular question, but they had a hypothesis. And you can read back somebody writing something, you know, half a century ago, and you go, wow, that's really really quite amazing and insightful. We, we know some of that now because we have the technology to address it. But at that time, it was just pure thought. Are there so, any examples in yeah. the field of biology and uh, cellular neuroscience where there was a researcher maybe a couple centuries ago that mm -hmm. had a hypothesis that wasn't uh, feasible to be tested given the mm -hmm. technology and technological constraints they have? And now maybe with 
artificial intelligence and machine learning models, yeah. some of those hypotheses are much more feasible to look more into. Yeah, it's funny you should say that. There, there certainly, there are quite a lot. There is one very famous example I think would be um, a couple of scientists um, and biology students might have heard of one of them because one of the um, parts of a cell is named after that person. It's uh, His name was uh, Camille Golgi. And so the Golgi apparatus is in every cell. So when you take just general biology class, you learn that right away. Well, this was a person. And um, so Camille Golgi was kind of an anatomist, a neuroanatomist. Um, and he worked in the 1800s. Mm. And in the 1800s, uh, things weren't terribly advanced in terms of uh, science, right? The microscopy was just coming along, um, but all the things that we take for granted now were not there. Um, so if you wanted to study the nervous system, how do you do that without the, the, the technical abilities? Well, he developed this, this, this uh, stain that when applied to tissues of the nervous system, very kind of randomly and selectively stained just individual cells, which allowed uh, for him to look at something and just kind of draw very precise uh, drawings and images of what a nervous cell looked like. And then there was another person who was a contemporary of his called Camilo Golgi, I mean, sorry, so called uh, Anamoni Cajal, who um, um, was uh, also a budding neuroanatomist. Um, and yeah, they, had, they both had a theory about how nerve cells communicate with each other. You know, uh, uh, is it all electrical sort of communication and um, one long wire? Or are, they, are there very specific connections between cells? Um, and uh, they were able to answer some of these questions at that point. Um, but now, probably, what, um, uh, 150 years later, um, we can confirm that what they were proposing was true because we have the ability to look at um, tissues at a very, 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 very fine resolution to the, to the point of down to nanometers and even angstroms. Mm -hmm. And so we know, for example, that uh, cells connect in a way that Ramon Cajal proposed and that they form networks. Um, but that was um, one of those things that was impossible to answer at that time. Yeah. Are there any examples of maybe hypothesis researchers and neuroscientists have now that mm. may not be um, feasible to test or look more into given our current technological constraints, but maybe in the next 40, 50, 60 mm. and so forth years, devices maybe like Neuralink that mm. can be inserted to the brain may enable um, those hypotheses and uh, areas much more feasible um, to look into. Yeah, I mean, I think, so I, my work is on the visual system. So the visual system, um, and specifically the retina, which is how you detect light um, and how you can see, is part of the brain. Right? Um, people tend to not know that. It's actually a direct kind of extension of the brain. It goes through, um, uh, connected to the brain via the optic nerve. Anyways, it's a very accessible part of the nervous system. Um, and so for that reason, people have studied it for the better part of 100 years, more even. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, those scientists that I mentioned, one of them has a whole book, that's part of it over there, <laughs> that, uh, that is dedicated on the visual system, on the retina, and on the structure of the retina. And even though we have studied that for for this long, we still have a number of questions that are completely unanswered. So if you take that, uh, the retina, which is a tiny piece of tissue, a couple of grams, and you extrapolate that to the brain, which is much, much larger, 10, 100 times, 1,000 times l larger, um, in terms of cells, innumerably more large, um, uh, you start to see that there are things that we really, really don't understand. We can, what we can do now is we can look 
at um, biological tissue, we can look at the brain, and we can describe things like what types of cells is it made out of, how do these cells connect to each other, you know, what kind of genes do they express, and how do they develop, how do they get to the right place, what happens to them perhaps when there's disease. But I think the big piece that is still missing is uh, for um, things that are not easily measurable. Uh, you know, how does a thought come to be, consciousness, all these things. What is the process that gets you from, from A to Z? Mm -hmm. uh, and there are sort of a lot of big black uh, holes uh, all along that pathway. Um, and so will we be able to figure this out in the next 40 or 50 years? Maybe. I, I, I don't know. It's, uh, it's very, very difficult to say because we don't know exactly how things... Things t tend to take these f funny turns um, and a lot of um, findings in science are a little bit uh, kind of fortuitous, if you will. And so, um, um, based on that, it might be that we figure some big pieces of that, you know, in 10 years. Mm -hmm. It might be that we, we're still scratching our heads 100 years from now. One common sentiment I've heard from many academics is that neuroscience as a field is still in its early stages and mm -hmm. the most profound and important discoveries are still yet to come. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with the sentiment? And if so, what's your sense of what these discoveries might look like? Yeah. Um, I, I probably the end my answer would be yes and 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 maybe no to some extent uh yes it is a very new field um but you know people have been fascinated with the brain and the nervous system for a very very long time not just in the last 10 or 20 years neuroscience as a term is a very new term and it sounds very fancy and all that but um the 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 study of the brain is has been and the nervous system has been going on for a very long time um so uh um y yes there they are um uh there are um um things that people have been able to uh, look at uh, in in great detail and so um Let's just take my field, for example, the, the, the retina and, the vis and vision. Um, we've learned a lot about vision from, from, uh, from work on the retina. And we, and we know a lot about it. Um, but sometimes my feeling is that we know a lot about kind of a limited set of things. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, naturally we're interested in um, uh, very much in, in understanding how the visual system works so that we can fix it for people that have problems with their vision. Um, but then on the other hand, we kind of leave other things a little bit unexplored. Um, and so I think uh, one of the next great um, uh, unexplored frontiers is to dive into those, into those areas. Uh, where we um, uh, try to understand how a component of the nervous system works, um, not just in its very minute, small parts down to the level of molecules, but to try to, to, to create a picture that takes you from, from the molecule to the part of the cell, to the cell, to the tissue, to the organ, to the whole animal, and to its behavior and how all of that works. And it's a little bit difficult to do because um, there's different types of science that looks at the different levels, right? Uh, you know, an ecologist doesn't really know a whole lot about how to do cell biology, neither does a cell biologist know how to do ecology and, and, and behavior. But I think being able uh, to combine all these things together to get a holistic picture is, is what neuroscience uh, needs uh, more of. Yeah. Um, 
One of the uh, questions I had was in regards to interdisciplinary collaborations, and mm. I might as well just bring it up now since yes. it's related to what you were talking about. Yeah. Are there any interdisciplinary collaborations from your uh, area in neuroscience with other areas of neuroscience or other like fields in science that you find particularly exciting and promising for future discoveries? Oh yes. Well, you you mentioned machine learning before. Um, so that's one uh, a good example there. Uh, uh, one of the things we do in, in my lab, in my research, but um, also just generally in, in biology is we try to um, create a, a map of how uh, things within a particular area of the, the body are connected. Mm -hmm. um, and in particular, for example, the brain, or in my case, the retina. And so we generally call these things connectomes, and it becomes important to understand, okay, so if you have a cell here, how does it connect to the next cell? How does that connect to the next cell? How do all of these things connect to each other in a network? What, what are the properties of this network? Because then that tells you, gives you information about how this whole system works, right? Um, and one way to do this is to look at really, really, really tiny details of connections between cells. Um, problem is, it's not that you have a dozen cells or a hundred cells or a thousand cells. You have millions and billions of them. Um, and they don't just make single connections to each other. They make hundreds and thousands uh, of them to um, to each other and between each other. And so once you start doing that multiplication, you start seeing that some of that becomes a really um, big task. You know, how do you reconstruct all these, all these maps and all these um, connections? Uh, and that's where machine learning comes. And, uh, you know, people can then take our data and say, okay, well, why don't we just give that to, um, to, uh, to a machine and see if the machine can, figure out things um, based on, you know, some ground truth that you give it. You, you tell it, okay, this is defined as a connection. Go ahead and look at these million cells and find me connections. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's difficult, but that has seen a lot of um, progress lately. And so that's one example. Another one is, um, I think, um, uh, people often think that um, sciences and different disciplines don't, you know, interact with each other, don't talk to each other, and and that's not really true. You know, um, a biologist needs to uh, a lot of times, you know, borrow from physics and and from chemistry and from all these other fields. Uh, because that's the way nature is, right? Things don't work in a vacuum. They work um, in um, concert with each other. And so um, uh, the visual system, you know, detects light. And so um, understanding the properties of light, which, you know, goes into physics, understanding um, the uh, biophysical principles that govern the uh, function of, of cells, all that becomes important. So um, I think um, uh, for one thing I would say is a lot of times um, uh, um, folks think, ah, you know, maybe I'll do biology because there's no math in it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm sorry to burst a bubble, but, but there is, but that's what makes it fun because being able to describe a process um, in the exact language of mathematics but applied to biology um, is really quite uh, interesting and it becomes quite fascinating. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, yeah. are there any ways you've integrated uh, machine learning models and AI into how mm. you've done research? Um, not yet, but I uh, I have some plans uh, for doing that. Mm -hmm. um, I have a colleague here, Dr. Robin Crook, who actually is doing that now. Uh, and again, it's it's work on on this type of um, imaging data that gives these these large. Um, um, uh, data sets of of these huge high resolution images and and um, tries to uh, understand the, the 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 map that they make. Mm -hmm. um, so um, another uh, actually another um, 
uh, way that uh, that uh, machine learning can get um, uh, can get involved is in looking at um, data that tells us about um, the genetic material that. Uh, that is either within certain cells or the whole body or et cetera, and the difference between sort of uh, genomes of different organisms. Mm -hmm. And so there you need a lot of powerful, um, a lot of powerful computing and, and more and more, um, uh, you know, AI and machine learning to try to, to try to piece things together. What do you think has been the most challenging aspect of your research in cellular neuroscience? Huh. Okay. Um, it depends on it depends on um, uh, if you're if whether you're asking about uh, sort of practical aspects of it or theoretical aspects of it, and so um, the practical aspects of it are um, are you know things about you know how do I I want to I have certain questions that I want to answer in in the research lab. Well, how do I set that up? Uh, especially if no one else has done it, um, and um, that can sometimes be challenging. It's it's super um, interesting and um, um, kind of fun to do to figure things out. It could be very frustrating, uh, but um, uh, that's one aspect. Another aspect is to um, is to um, when you are uh, working on something, is to uh, to 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 try to find questions that you can ask that are not just unanswered, but questions that that no one else has has thought of. Mm. Um, and um, in science, as probably everything else. Um, you kind of have to find your your niche and, and your lane, um, and sometimes the challenge, at least for me, but I, I, I suspect f for a lot of folks in science, is what's that? What's that niche? Right? Where? where um, um, where do you go? Because you do all your training. Um, under the mentorship of somebody else and their established sort of research directions. And all of a sudden now you have to start thinking about, well, I can't just go out and do the same thing, right? Um, you have to find something new. Uh, and finding something new <laughs> is, is difficult. Um, and not just new, but also something that um, isn't just an incremental advance on what you were doing, something that allows you to get into a, a, an area where you can just continue to ask questions. Mm -hmm. And maybe every next question you ask brings more questions um, and brings sort of open-ended uh, inquiry. Um, and so I, for example, in my personal experience, this is kind of um, what happened for me is I um, took bits and pieces of, of everything I did through my through in, in, in my training through you know undergraduate and graduate school and as a postdoctoral fellow and took sort of bits and pieces perhaps you know the the model the animal model system that I was working on in grad school but the techniques that I learned as a postdoc and then sort of some of the more basic questions that I that I that I was asking as an undergraduate and try to combine them together to to um, to get into a field of, of research that um, allows me to have my own thing, uh, but also uh, allows me to sort of explore it without concern that I'm stepping on somebody else's toes and mm -hmm. and um, uh, or that um, there's nothing you know there to more to find out. There's always something to find out. <laughs> Yeah, it seems yeah. like this challenge of finding your niche and sort of like your mm. place in the puzzle mm. um, is something that may be of, of articular challenge for people in science and looking mm. to be researchers. Yeah. But I think also relates to just more broadly speaking, the challenge that a lot of undergraduate students have in all fields where you can think of your undergraduate education as sort of like your training 
in mm. problem solving and you know everybody chooses a major so it's sort of what you're more specialized in yeah yeah and then entering the workforce is this challenge of like oh what problems do i want to work on what's my niche how do i mm. fit in the job economy so to speak yeah what advice would you give you know looking back at your experience and finding your niche for those young people or people hmm. finishing their training and research that are struggling to find their north star and what feels right to them yeah um a great question um i would say well first off um it it takes time mm -hmm. right to 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 find the thing that piques your interest that you're also good at that um that um sort of propels you forward and it's different i mean it's different in science than it is in uh, you know a student that is in business for example or or in in art or in something like that um if i mean if i had um um if i could go back for example you know thinking back to my undergraduate days some time ago uh, uh i would um I would love to go back kind of knowing uh, what I know now <laughs> and just um, explore and enjoy. I think um, that probably isn't um, possible for for sort of uh, undergraduate students that are kind of young and they're 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 just entering and they're very stressed about what to do, how to do, et cetera. But I, you know, I would say, um, take your time to not just uh, explore to to try to um, understand that probably the biggest thing you can get out of your your education is is um, that you can learn about things that um, that interest you, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's why you know you you take so many different classes, right? That is, it supposedly makes you kind of a well-rounded person. But the other benefit of that is then you know maybe you didn't know you were interested in history, so you take a history class, and all of a sudden you go, well, "This is really, this really is very interesting to me. I like to know more. I like to understand more." Or maybe you take science, and you go, "Oh, this is really, really." really cool i mean obviously i'm biased in that respect but when i think about science i think oh you know i yes i i'm a biologist but i could have probably have been just as interested in you know physics or biochemistry or or math uh, as a as a career pursuit because um i just love love that sort of stuff my mind is drawn towards um, things that allow me to explain the world around me and to explain it to myself. Um, and I find great satisfaction in sort of figuring something out and having a moment where I go, yes, I, I think I understand this now. Um, I want to know more. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I think one of the um, um, one of the things I see sometimes with students is that they're a little bit hesitant to, you know, go and talk to professors and to faculty members. Um, I mean, yes, I it's intimidating sometimes. Um, here at State, we're very approachable. I like to think, um, but. I would encourage anyone who's listening to this, and just in general, if you're a student, you know, go talk to to your professors. Uh, chances are, not many students actually approach them and say, "Look, I'm really interested in this, and 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 you know, I was looking at what you do and what you teach, and do you think you know I can ask you a few questions about that?" Um, and I'm pretty sure that um, hardly anyone, if anyone, will say, no, 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 I don't have time. I'm really busy. I'm really busy filling out this, you know, administrative report they want me to do to talk to the student. They'll, uh, <laughs> they'll always would prefer to talk to you. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and then sometimes you just, you don't, you don't know where these conversations lead. You don't know um, who's going to tell you something that you go, you know, this sounds really interesting. I'd like to understand that more and learn more about that. Um, 
And, um, you know, it's an old adage, but uh, but maybe, you know, nowadays people don't do it as much. Just just ask, ask for help, ask for advice. Um, that's part of the reason a lot of a lot of people get into kind of academia is because they're not just interested in the academic pursuit. They also are interested in, you know, sort of interacting with students and and uh, teaching them, but also helping them find find their way. Yeah, I really resonate with the answer. Um, just to sort of like vouch for what you're saying. It's interesting. Like I have a conversation with a computational neuroscientist and I'm like, man, I could so do that. And then I'll have a conversation with, you know, a physicist or an economist. And I'm like, oh, man, like all these fields, I could totally see myself doing that. But it takes that um initiating step of like i'm gonna have a conversation and explore yeah. it and open myself up to the possibility of mm -hmm. becoming interested in this subject matter looking back are there any examples of other topics that really captured your interest and imagination and maybe ways that you sort of related mm -hmm. your interest in those topics with your research and how you think about cellular neuroscience now mm. yeah um interesting um so to to say something about what you what you just remarked yes i i think um there, there's a lot of times where and it's human nature where we go uh I, you know i don't know if i could do this i don't know if you know i don't know if i could uh this seems really complicated and it seems really difficult um, and it's not that just I can't do the work but it seems like you know eh, maybe that's not that's not feasible um, but it's you know whenever you think that um, I, I would say I, I, the, my encouragement would be well like of course if you look at a professional athlete right and the way they play a sport for example um, of course they look amazing right of course they they're they're, they're really really good at it Yes, but they've spent a lot of time perfecting that, right? It didn't start that way, and everybody has to start someplace. Um, so just kind of remember that. And so whether that's um, about, uh, you know, doing something in sports or doing something in science or any other discipline, you know, everybody starts somewhere. And it's a matter of, uh, of just sort of convincing yourself that, yeah, of course, just because it sounds scary doesn't mean that it can't be explored and I can't learn how to do that. We all we all have great capacity to learn, right? And when you add that to um, being curious, it's a powerful combination. Um, I digressed a little bit there, but you know, you were asking me uh, sort of, is there anything else that that you've been able to sort of translate into 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 what you do? So I I really like history, for example. Mm. And uh, I, um, now I'm not going to talk about you know sort of other fields of science, but things like history and languages and um, uh, uh, understanding and learning about how sort of um, things came to be um, uh, are really interesting to me. So, for example, um, uh, I'd like to understand. Um, you know, when I go visit a place, all right, well, who built that building? Um, um, and, uh, you know, what was the industry that established this town? And who are the people that came here? Where did they come from? Right? Uh, uh, who were they? What were they like? Uh, you know, why is there this particular type of food here? Um, and it all kind of comes from somewhere. And it's, it's when you start digging, you start seeing that there are a lot of connections that people have either forgotten about that they never knew uh, about, you know, how, um, um, I don't know, even here in San Francisco, you know, you've got, you've got um, all these these beautiful houses and you look at them and, and, and you go, well, this is really beautiful. It's kind of unusual, right? You Victorian don't really... architecture. Yeah, but it's also sort of borrow things from, from, um, from Russian architecture because why right, during the gold rush, there were uh, a lot of Russians that came over here to California. Um, and it's very reminiscent of a very classical sort of Russian looking houses. If you go, if you go to Russia, um, and um, 
then you go, if you say go, you know, in some of the towns in the area, you start learning about how um, there was a lot of um, a clashing between uh, Spain and Russia, of all things, <laughs> about who was going to who was going to establish dominance in this area of California, and were you know was the population going to be mostly Catholic or mo mostly Eastern Orthodox? And I go, I had no idea that this was going on. And the only reason I found out is because I was in a town, and and I went to a museum, and it had all these all these uh, descriptions about you know what was going on during Imperial uh, Russia and, um, you know, uh, Mexico at the time um, and, and, uh, and the clashes and on the other, on the other side, you know, the, uh, um, the United States. So, um, yeah, that sort of thing, I think, um, it really piques my interest. And, um, um, and I find, you know, funnily enough that um, uh, you start looking at history, and then all of a sudden, that um, uh, turns around, and um, it gets you back to to your own, you know, field. Mm. So the history of science, and um, and so um, I think um, uh, I one of the things that that I have found as I'm as I get older uh, is that. Um, uh, curiosity sort of leads me places um, that uh, um, sort of really open up new areas uh, of, of thought for me. Mm -hmm. um, they have nothing to do with science, but all of that as one big picture tends to kind of inform uh, sort of what I do. Mm -hmm. um, and, it's, and it's fun, right? So. Yeah. Um, are there any um, personal experiences or pivotal moments you've had, whether working on your research or outside mm -hmm. of your research, that have significantly impacted your research or your career path? Yeah, um, I had quite a few like that. I um, so in um, in science, a lot of times, um, you know, people from the outside look at it and say, "Oh, you know, you have to." You know the, the way you, the, the way to do science is you know you you go and you you, you do your classes and and you and you get straight A's and 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 you just bury yourself in the books and and in the research and and that's it. And it turns out that's not that's not the the whole picture, not not nearly the whole picture. Um, uh, you know, science is populated with people, and you have to. You know, communicate with people and talk to people, and so um, uh, it's just as important as as actually doing the actual stuff. So, um, you know, one one probably pivotal moment f for me was when I was an undergrad. I was taking a biology class, and then um, the instructor, and I was back in in New York. Said, oh, you know, uh, uh, so we have. I have this opportunity. A colleague of mine is 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 hosting this sort of lab-based course out in a research station in Massachusetts. And I had sort of sort of heard of, of this research station, and I was interested. And um, and so they're looking for somebody to help out to be kind of a, a an, an assistant for for this course. You know, from for, for for everything from you know making solutions to to you know running the day to day stuff for this course that was two weeks. Uh, and I immediately thought, oh, this sounds very interesting. My very next thought was, ah, darn it, I you know, <laughs> I'm intimidated. I don't want to go and say I'm interested. Um, somehow, thankfully, I overcame that. And I said, you know what? I'll just go and let me just let me just see. So I went and and I talked to, to that professor, and she said, oh, you know, um, good, because because um, um, you're the first one that that came. So um, let me go ahead and ask if that's still available. Thankfully, it was. From that point on. Um, I was able to go on, and I sort of I got the 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 job um, for that course, uh, which was um, 
funnily enough um, and fortuitously in the area of vision science. Mm. And so I went, that was even before I was interested in anything that had to do with sort of, with sort of vision. Um, I went, uh, I became part of this course, and then um, every next time that that was being held, which was every couple of years, I went back. Um, and I met a ton of people, um, uh, friends, sort of colleagues, uh, and to this day, and at this point, you know, I, I did it, I think, five or six times. Um, every time I go to a conference or have a, you know, somewhere where I'm, you know, uh, um, doing the, the science, I, I run into people that I have met through this course, either other faculty members, former students that are now faculty members, or they're doing sort of research someplace. And and at this point, it's, it's more than, you know, 100 people. Um, um, and, and I often think about what would have happened if I didn't go, right? If I didn't, if I didn't say I'm really interested, if I hadn't gotten over that little sort of or big hesitation and I didn't go and say, look, I'm interested, can I, can you put in a good word for me? Um, and, um, and I don't know, you know, so the sort of the, the, a bit the moral of the story is that you, you just never know. So um, it's always worth trying if it's something that you that you're interested in and sort of piques your curiosity. Um, and then whatever happens happens, right? Mm -hmm. um, but um, that was one of those experiences that that kind of laid the path for a lot of the stuff that that I ended up doing afterwards. I ended up also fortuitously, or I don't know, by design, in in the lab that did uh, research uh, on vision, which really coincided well with what I did in the course. A lot of times, um, the people that I met in the course ended up being, you know, people that that I could collaborate with later on, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that was one of those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah, thanks for the answer. And sure. I want to get a bit more into your research. Mm -hmm. I uh, read on your LinkedIn that you're interested in the mechanisms that guide connectivity and information processing in the retina during health and disease. Yes. And I'm curious how the processing of information in the retina differs when it's healthy compared to when it's combating disease. Oh, well, that's the million dollar question, right? That was so, that's what um, a lot of people are trying to find out. So um, first off, the retina, sorry, we, I keep saying retina, retina, and then maybe people don't know what that is. <laughs> that's um, a piece of nervous tissue, very sort of thin piece of nervous tissue that lines the back of your eye and essentially is sensitive to light. And so that's how you detect any light that comes into your eye. And then all that light gets processed, gets um, gets um, uh, changed into uh, electrical signals, which then get, um, get sent from cell to cell to cell and eventually up to the brain. And at all of these sort of relay stations, if you will, there's a lot of processing that goes on. There's a lot of filtering, there's a lot of um, sort of um, refining, uh, removing information that isn't relevant, um, so that by the time it gets to the point where information is in the visual cortex, it becomes um, something that you sort of interpret um, as an image, right? Um, well, so needless to say, all of that is is pretty complicated, right? You've got a ton of different um, um, cells that communicate with each other, relay stations, um, and when you have a disease state, for example, in the retina, um, the question is always, well, how does all that change? Because the way the cells in the retina communicate with each other are very um, uh, precisely defined. And just to be clear, we're talking about disease in the retina, not disease as in like someone struggling with a fever. Uh, disease in the retina, but um, uh, you know, all sorts of uh, different disease ends up having uh, some sort of um, um, effect on the visual system, okay. even if you don't think about it. Right? So nobody thinks about diabetes and, and thinks about problems with vision, but actually does happen. Right? Are most of those imperceptible? 
Uh, maybe, well, uh, if you're lucky, there might be, but mm-hmm. then um, even if there are that way to start with, if if things worsen, then then you, you you notice it, and then at the point you start to notice it, is where is where you where things have progressed far enough that they might not be uh, fixable, at least yeah. not with what we know now. But um, so the way things change in disease, for example, is is um, this sort of network of cells that communicate with each other, um, and and is very precisely arranged. In, in a healthy retina, well, what happens when you know the input to this to this network, uh, you know, for example, the cells that detect light, what happens when they when they die out, which is sometimes happens in, in particular types of, of vision diseases. Um, well, so then then the rest of the cells start rearranging. And they start looking for maybe surviving partners, uh, or they start kind of atrophying, or they start doing all sorts of weird things that we still don't quite understand. And so um, when that happens, it becomes very difficult to, to essentially return the system to its healthy state. Um, and so in, in vision, we try to do that with a number of different approaches. Say, for example, we try to do that with, um, okay, if, uh, if a whole bunch of cells have, have died, what if we put in, you know, stem cells in the retina, right? And have them, have them develop, you know, give them sort of, give them the right push and have them develop into the, into the cells that disappeared. And hopefully, you know, they can fill in the function. And should we think about the adding of stem cells as like through injection or maybe through surgery? Basically, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of, it's not very, it, it's not very sci-fi. It's a, it's a little bit crude at times. You, mm-hmm. you literally inject it into the subretinal space, and hope that things work out. Um, so yeah, it turns out that doesn't work terribly well because because um, uh, either the cells don't survive. Or even if they do survive in the small numbers that they do, they uh, uh, may not necessarily make the right connections. Would you attribute most of that failure to the faults of the vehicle through which you're adding Mm. stem cells to the eyes Mm. or to the inability of the network, so to speak, to adapt to like the new cells being there? That is a great question. Are you interested in research? <laughs> um, so, I mean, to, to some extent, the first thing you mentioned, the way the way we deliver it, we have ways of of sort of controlling for that and and figuring out that you know that's not what's causing the the the, the failure essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the the other thing that becomes more complicated is um, is that uh, you know these cells that you introduce there well they they, they, they we, we you need to understand how that environment that you introduce them into um, actually affects anything that come that comes into it mm-hmm. so for example cells communicate with each other right and um, maybe maybe the incoming cells uh, um, don't carry the right signals so that they can be incorporated into into the network. Um, well, how do you know? Well, we need to know what those signals are. Well, how do you know that? Well, then you have to go and find out, okay, uh, which cells secrete the signals. Uh, if they do, uh, what are those signals? Okay, once you know that, well, how is that different from when you have something healthy to when you have something diseased? Um, then, can we change those signals, right? Uh, or can we change the way those signals are being received? Uh, or can we change the way uh, the response to those signals is being uh, incorporated? So at all these stages, and maybe at all these stages, those are possibilities for intervention. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, um, that's still a very, very, very active area of research. It's not what I do, 
because um, there are many people working on that and with um, with uh, you know sort of huge labs and, and a lot of resources and it's great um, I am I've, I've since coming to, to SF state generally what one, one of the things that I have become um, very interested in is is uh, taking a step back and looking at what can we learn from visual systems that are not kind of um, uh, the the standard that we know of. So, meaning other species are still just in humans. Other species. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, what we work on uh, in the lab is actually a type of fish. Mm. Uh, it's called a skate, and it's a cousin to sharks and rays, um, and uh, it's kind of this sort of benthic fish. It, it's 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 um, it's got a flat triangular body, and so um, it has a visual system that's quite interesting. So in our visual system, so in just in mammals and in basically the majority of, of vertebrates, things with a spine, the retina uh, has two types of light sensitive cells. And why does a spine matter? Um, you know what, it's funny, because it shouldn't, but that was, that was somebody some time ago said, look, um, um, things with a spine, you know, are in this family, things without a spine are in this family. Huh. Um, and uh, for a lot of purposes, it, it doesn't, right? Mm -hmm. For, you know, if you look at the eye of an octopus, which doesn't have a spine, and they look at the eye of a mouse, they do, uh, um, they are arranged in very similar ways. Uh, there are some big differences, but they, they, they have found a way, sort of, uh, you know, nature has found a way, evolution has pushed them through to essentially perform the tasks that they need to perform uh, very well, despite the fact that this one doesn't have a spine and this one visually. has a spine, visually, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, but you know, that's that's the distinction we make, um, and it's one of those things that, that um, people always kind of sort of mention, okay, so this is a vertebrate, this one is an invertebrate. Um, anyway, um, um, the so most of these animals have light sensitive cells that are called rods and cones and so right now for example uh, in this sort of bright light we're using um, mostly our cones so and those light sensitive cells are mostly congregated in their eyeball there isn't like round right? they are in your retina okay and so and um they better be in your eyeball, otherwise yeah, something has gone really wrong. Like dispersed around in other species. Uh, actually, good point. In photoreceptors, or light sensitive cells uh, can be found outside of of the eye, or sort of organs that detect light can be found uh, in, in in things that one would not normally consider. Oh, this is just a, an eye, right? But maybe they're not connected in a way to the brain for you to like perceive them. Yeah, not in probably not in the same way. Okay. And so this opens up a whole thing, right? A whole series of questions that they could be asking. Mm -hmm. So, um, so getting back to that, these these cones, these light sensitive cells that are in your retina, you and I are using them right now, yeah, in daylight and to see color. And then and then we have these these rods, which are really really l very sensitive cells, and you use those um, uh, in really dim light, okay. uh, and for your peripheral vision. And so these two systems kind of uh, piggyback off each other. When the cones are working, the, 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 the rods are too sensitive and they kind of saturate it so they don't work. So should we think about the, let's call it collaboration between cones and rods as sort mm -hmm. of a seesaw where we mm -hmm. all have these experiences where we're in a dim room playing video games, for example, and then yes. you walk out, sun's out, and then you sort of like, I don't know what the word for in, in English is for it, yeah. but in Spanish it's called encandilado, where yeah. you walk out and then it's like, whoa, there's so much Really brightness. bright. And then you're like adjusting to the difference in brightness. Is that sort of like the seesaw between cones and rocks? Yeah. So what you're describing essentially is, is adaptation, mm -hmm. light and dark adaptation. So you've, you've had that. You, that's, that's, a, that's a great example because I give that to my students all the time, right? When you are in a movie theater, if anybody goes to the movies anymore, you come out of the movie theater and all of a sudden there's really bright light and it takes you 
you know, a, a minute or so to just to, to adapt to that level. Uh -huh. When you walk into a really dark room, you don't immediately see, but if you wait for a minute or two, you start seeing a lot more detail, and that's your sort of, in, in, in essence, dark adaptation. So if there was ever uh, anybody that was listening, for example, that yeah. wanted to experience adaptation in real time yeah. in the visual system, it's just be in a dark room and then go outside in the light or vice versa. Yes, I mean, don't you know? Don't hurt yourself or anything. Yeah. But um, but yeah, that's uh, the process itself works on many different levels. Um, but that's kind of a, a, a really um, the, the simplest way to describe it. And so your visual system is very good at that, that you call a seesaw. And it's a very nice uh, description of it. It kind of goes back and forth from light to dark, dark to light. We, we change environments a lot. And so your visual system adapts really, 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 really well. Um, and so here's the, the really nice sort of uh, twist to that. Um, the visual system of the animal that we work with, this, this uh, skate, um, only has one type of light sensitive cell, mm. which is very similar to, to a rod. We kind of call it rod or rod like. It's more like night vision, we should think of. One would think, right? Yeah. Turns out that um, it can adapt. The visual system of the skate can adapt from really sort of high sensitivity, kind of night vision, really dim light vision, to bright light vision. Only it does that in the absence of cones, the cells that you use to do that. Oh, okay. Um, and then it can go back, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So it can do that with one cell type. So it can do the cones job with only rods? Or at least part of the cones job with only okay. rods. And so how? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so that opens up a whole slew of very interesting questions because here we have an animal that we know can see, uh, and it can see, you know, pretty well, um, and it can adapt. It can adapt to really sort of dark environments. It can adapt to bright environments, but it does that with one uh, complement of cells. Well, what is it about these cells that allow them to do that? What it is about the network within the retina that these cells are connected to that allows that whole system to work that way? Um, because um, um, we, what we know about the visual system comes from the visual systems of animals that have both rods and cones mm. a lot of the times. And, and yes, we know a lot about that, but um, we are only scratching the surface about understanding, uh, okay, so how is it that you need that? You have a visual system uh, in other animals that has these components, yet it is possible to, to do most of these functions in an animal that doesn't have all of them. Mm -hmm. um, and to, to extend that, okay, so let's say you have a disease uh, of the visual system in humans where either the rods or the cones die, which happens. You know, there are a lot of diseases like that. Um, one of the things that then ensues is that when the rods die, the cones aren't sensitive enough to do the jobs that the rods do. How would a person whom that's occurred in experience, let's say they lose the rods, but they have the cones, how would they experience the dark room? So if they, um, if they lose their rods or their rods are, are malfunctioning, that's um, sometimes a condition called night blindness. Okay. And so they can still see certain things, but, but the detail uh, of those things is, is much reduced. And so the visual system is very good at detecting edges. Um, and so, for example, a person that's not night blind um, might not be able to do that. So driving, for example, at night for somebody who's night blind is going to be very, very difficult. Would maybe a good exercise for those of us curious to maybe get a glimpse into what that experience might be like for those individuals yeah. is, let's say, take a camera that isn't that good, yeah. like a smartphone camera of an old smartphone, <laughs> yeah. go into a dark room and then see what you see because you have all your rods, but yeah. then see what the camera sees that isn't yeah. that great in that dark environment and yeah. then sort of compare like, oh, this person, like, it, it sort of like provides a visual to like, 
That's yeah, what that must be like. Yeah, absolutely. Or you can even take, um, if people have those anymore, a flip phone camera <laughs> mm -hmm. and try that. Um, so just remember that you are you're going to need to give your uh, sort of rod system a little bit of time to adapt. Mm -hmm. And the longer you stay in that dark room, the more it's going to adapt and the more sensitive it's going to become and the more detail you're going to see. Huh. Um, and so the the um, but yeah, that would be a fun that would be a fun experiment to do. Should we think about that more akin to hypertrophy training and then muscle size girls, or should we think about it more as like a reorientation of like the network uh, in yeah. collaboration with like the inputting light sensitive cells? So it is it is it's it's a dynamic process that happens on a lot of times on the molecular level that that adaptation there are a lot of different sort of mechanisms within cells and between cells that help um make that happen um and um the at least as far as we know anyway the the the, the cells themselves don't change in number for example right you don't get you don't all of a sudden get a whole bunch more rods when you're in the dark that disappear when you're in the light. It's the cells that you have are the cells that you have, but they are kind of plastic, if you will. They're, they're able to, to adapt to these different environments through all these uh, sort of mechanisms that you know, people have studied uh, for you know, 100 years, essentially. Yeah, yeah but... Um, um, I was gonna. One of the things that I wanted to mention uh, before. So, for example, when 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 your rods malfunction uh, and your cones are still working, you know, people people can people can live with that, right? It's when the cones die that things become really really difficult because cones are for the most part concentrated in the area that's responsible for your central vision. Mm. So, whenever you look at something whether you're, you're looking at somebody you're reading, et cetera, when you're focusing on something, the majority of that vision is mediated by cones. And implicit in that like architecture of the visual system, mm. should it maybe be, should we think about that as like, oh, throughout evolution, humans will like sleep in the night and live in the day. So that's why, like, they <laughs> yeah. orient themselves in that way. Yeah, so, I, so one fun question that I always ask is, right, we know rods are for dim light vision and, and cones are for bright light vision. Um, uh, which one do we think came first? Mm. Um, and so, I don't know, let me ask you this, because it's, it's a fun question, right? What do you think is, is older, a rod or a cone? You know, given what mm. you know about dinosaurs and everything else and their sort of primordial mix, what would make more sense to you? Interesting question. Um, well, what I'm thinking about is the sun, right? Like, if yeah. there isn't that much sun, then rods yeah. would be much more uh, <laughs> useful, right? Yeah. Now, the question is, like, was there life before the sun? <laughs> uh, yeah. Or, I guess I'd guess cones, since I'm not sure life is possible without the sun. Right? Um, so you would be in, in one of the few people that would say cones. Most people would think, oh, it's rods, because, you know, rods are for dim light, and, and there wasn't that much light. Really? Uh, I would have guessed everyone said cones. Uh, so no, you you everyone most of the times ninety percent of the time I would say everybody says rods, really? just for some intuitive reason, and they and and that's wrong actually it's it's cones. Oh, cones, it is cones. are the ones that are evolutionarily older than rods, and we know that from from a number of different studies. That How much older? Uh, that's that's a good question. That I don't think I can answer exactly, but but. Essentially, what we do know is that all the elements that cones have, um, if we look at at you know how long these genes um, that encode for these things have been around, that consistently the things that are found in cones, we find that that are sort of more conserved. Uh, therefore, you know we we can deduce by a variety of different methods that have been around for for for, for longer, mm -hmm. um, and. Um, uh, rods, it turns out, you know, evolved out of cones. The funny thing is that in vertebrates, and actually in mammals, the rod and the cone system are not uh, equivalent in the way they connect within within the retina. 
you know, cones are very, I don't know, for lack of a better word, diligent. They they receive the signal, they transmit it to a, a to a to a kind of intermediary cell, which then transmits it to another cell, which then sends information via the optic nerve to the brain. And you would think rods do the same thing, right? Um, turns out they don't. They receive a signal, then they send it to an intermediary cell, and instead of directly sending it out of the retina through a third cell, all of that information gets fed into the cone circuitry. I think we could corroborate that qualitatively <laughs> as well, because it does feel like in nighttime you walk out, it does feel like a different system is sort of operating when like, you're trying to perceive things, you know? Perhaps, yeah. So, um, but... Uh, when people looked at that, they said, oh, wait a minute. So essentially what rods tend to do a lot of times is they kind of borrow the, the circuitry. They piggyback off mm -hmm. of cones. Um, and so uh, um, that's sort of another piece of evidence that, you know, things were there and established. And then only uh, only later on, sort of you, you develop that part of the, of the visual system. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have something like the skin that has cells that are really cone -like, uh, rod like. Um, the skin. Um, no, the skate. Sorry. Oh, okay. Um, and so, if the skate has only rods or rod like cells, in the absence of any cones, how do those cells communicate in the absence of all that cone network? Right. We're trying to find that out. We don't. We don't really quite know yet. It, we know that the components are there, we know that the information gets transmitted, but exactly what the composition of that circuitry is, we're still we're still finding out. Um, and so um, 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 this uh, sort of rod cone uh, di dichotomy, if you will, this sort of rod cone interaction um, is, um, uh, I think, a, a very interesting uh, field of study. Yeah, um, that's what we're trying to do in, in, in my research, um, and um, this has become essentially my niche, if you will. I'm really interested in trying to paint a picture for both me and the audience of mm -hmm. what it must be like for a person dealing with um, oh. divergent, let's call it, visual system, mm -hmm. either induced by disease. But one of the questions that I wanted to ask you is. Have you looked into maybe how the visual system changes um, when it's like drug induced, maybe like in psycho uh, and psychedelic experiences? Huh. I remember I've had experiences where it's like low dose psilocybin and everything seems a little bit brighter. And I'm curious about how that might relate to maybe what's going on with the cones and rods and how my system is like perceiving light. Um, the short answer is I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and it may be that that is an effect on the retina and the rods and the cones, but it very well may be that that's an effect much higher up in 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 the circuit, right? Yeah. Beyond the retina. Qualitatively, it feels yeah. like, you know, if and I love thinking about this as well. Uh, it's kind of analogous, like the function of cameras, you know, like mm -hmm. the light and mm -hmm. stuff like that. It it just felt like you turn the brightness up. Mm -hmm. That's like most of what was happening visually. So I'm wondering if like, man, I wonder if that's like how the brain's perceiving and receiving <laughs> the information or if there's something going on in the retina. It might be, it might be perception. I mean, that's one of those, uh, that's one of those a, a little bit of black holes, right? How to, what is it that in the brain changes that then you perceive in a particular way? Like mm -hmm. what are the, what are the mechanisms that guide that? And when you think about it, answering questions like that is very, very, very difficult, right? Because yeah. you, you can't, um, first of all, you don't have a way of, of monitoring that directly uh, live as it's happening, right? Um, and even if you did, you still had to know where to look. Like what part of the brain is actually responsible for that? And not just what part, what cells within that part of the brain are responsible for that. Um, and, uh, you know, we're still, it's, it's, we're still doing rudimentary things when it comes to that because it, it's, it, we can only understand 
uh, you know, sort of function of the brain or the retina, for that for that matter, um, in sort of bits and pieces, right? Maybe we can take a piece of tissue and you very carefully culture it, and then we put it under the microscope and we find a way to visualize it. But that's this little piece that's not working in the context of the entire system. It's not receiving that input and sending that output. We we can answer questions about that little piece. But maybe those are relevant, maybe those are completely irrelevant when you put that piece back into the entire system, right? Yeah. And how do you do that? I don't have an answer to that, but um, that's that's always the conundrum, right? Um, how much of 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 what you find out from 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 doing experiments that way is going to be um, is going to be um, uh, related to to the whole system yeah unperturbed system um yeah and the reason why i bring up a drug like psilocybin as well is because you know we talked earlier about the effect a disease can have on mm. retinal function right yeah and it seems like maybe drugs maybe in the future in like a research context taking a psilocybin dose is like okay we're going to Mm, not mess up but just like put your retinal system and your visual system in like a different state but yeah. it's just temporary eight hours and you're not actually having a disease you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> so maybe that's um um uh, that's where also the 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 ethical part of research comes into play right you can't just <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> take somebody and 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 give them a drug and 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 put them in a dark room, right? Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't work that way, right? It takes, you know, that's first of all, you, you know, um, um, even if the person agrees, uh, uh, even then, you 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 know, you you a, a lot of times you, you're not allowed to do that sort of stuff, you know, for very very good reason, mm -hmm. and so um, and so that's. Th th that's that's where things are tricky, right? How do you answer these questions? Well, you know, sometimes you turn to model systems, sometimes you turn to to computer simulations, and that's where things become interesting. You have to you have to to answer a question. Sometimes, if you're lucky, you might be able to find a way to answer that question directly. Most of the times, you're not that lucky. Most of the times, you have to combine a number of different things to maybe answer the question to some extent. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then, of course, people are going to ask you, oh, what about this? What about that? Did you think of that? Did you did you try that? Um, so um, uh, that being said, however, whenever you see, whenever you see, um, whenever, whenever you see a people, for example, in the psychology department, um, uh, look for volunteers because they're doing research, um, they have approved protocols to work with human subjects, and then um, it's good. I sort of I, I would encourage you to, to 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 go and find out if you're interested because um, that's that's where you can get involved, you know, in the right way. And hopefully, if it's a if it's a well designed study, they can they can they can find an answer to to an interesting question. Yeah, and to sort of round out our conversation about mm -hmm. um, cones and rods. Yes, I want to see if we can um, attach like a parameter definition, maybe that's not the best term to use, but like a parameter definition to like what the effect of the absence of cones and rods would mean versus what the effect of the deterioration of cones mm. and rods. Like would the absence of, let's say, rods mean you can't really perceive dim light well, or let's use cones for example, like the absence of cone rods you can't really perceive bright light well, but maybe the deterioration of them is that it's blurry. So it's like mm. one setting is blurry, one setting is brightness. Yes, great question. So, um, I can't resist to refer back to something that I did as, as a postdoc, which is um, we did a study um, where we uh, we had a way of of um, removing only um, sort of a gradually increasing number of the rods. Mm -hmm. We did that for cones as well, but the picture is a little bit more complicated there. And the interesting thing is that because that's what happens um, in, in disease, you, you don't immediately have, you know, you, you have all of your light sensitive cells one day and then the next day they're gone. It's, it's usually a progression. But you were saying, well, perhaps the progression is you start seeing things blurry or, or you start noticing that progression. It turns out, at least from what we saw, that that's 
actually not the case. Mm -hmm. The visual system is very, very, very good at compensating up to a point. And so, so we saw, for example, that when you removed um, uh, sort of gradually about 50% of the rods, by the time you look at the output of the system, the way the retina was signaling to the brain, and that was in mice, um, you saw that a lot of the signaling was preserved. So there was compensation. Mm -hmm. In fact, it took probably removing 80 or more percent of the rods to start seeing really significant effects uh, at the output. And so the takeaway lesson was that there was compensation. And when we saw that, we started wondering about it. And then we looked at, um, at um, uh, sort of human data, clinical data. And it turns out that uh, when people are losing, for example, their, their, their photoreceptors, uh, and they're losing them gradually, they, their, their, their visual tests, their visual sort of acuity tests and other tests that you, that you can use to, to change vision are, are pretty much sort of normal or are, you know, not indicative of something really, really serious going on until you get to that drop off point of the point where the system can't compensate for the loss anymore, mm -hmm. right? Through all, through, through all the different components of the rest of the circuitry. And then it just drops off a cliff. And so you're fine, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine, and then boom, it's gone. And so it would be perhaps better for us if things were gradual and we could notice them. Uh, but unfortunately, that's not the way it works. And maybe for a good reason, right? Maybe, you know, it's, it's good to, you know, imagine you are, you know, in the savannah and, and, and you've got some sort of, some sort of problem with your visual system. It's gonna, it's gonna compensate for as much as possible for as long a time as possible. Um, and then afterwards you're lion food. Um, Sorry. That is an interesting debate <laughs> to have whether um, we should think of that as a feature or a mm. bug, the design where it's like, it's better that it compensates and then it falls off a cliff, or if it's better if it's gradual and you can notice it, because I would guess that like most people would fall under the range where it's like, okay, and it's compensating. Yeah. And it's like, cool, you have 100%, close to 100% <laughs> quality yeah. of vision, right? Yeah. Whereas if it was gradual, then it's like, okay, now the trade-off is you can notice it, but yeah. you may live life with like 70%, 80% of where it was before. Yeah. And, you know, and it's, and it's um, um, that sort of gradual, you know, we tend to think of things because, you know, we live in, a, in, in, you know, you live in the present and now, and what would I, would it be, would it be better for me to, to sort of have a particular quality of life or would it be better, better for me to, to know what's happening sooner? Mm. Um, well, it depends, right? I, I would say probably better for you to know sooner um, so that perhaps you can do something about it. Um, but, you know, nature is nature. That's not the way things work. So we, we have ways of, that, that, of, of, of finding out that things are wrong even when they don't appear wrong. But that requires that you are proactive about it. Mm -hmm. You know, I just like going to the dentist. You don't go to the dentist when you're when you're <laughs> when your tooth breaks and you're you when you're in a ton of pain. You go every once in a while and you get everything checked out so that you catch things in time before they hurt. Same same thing with everything else, and it's the same thing with the visual system. Uh, so uh, if I can do my sort of uh, uh, public announcement bit, do check your eyes regularly. Um, just like uh, you do with everything else, um, because sometimes you can find things uh, out uh, early, and it's early enough that you can do something about it. Mm. Yeah, and maybe from yeah. an evolution perspective, it's in the best interest of like the way evolution sort of like affects our architecture to say, okay, we're going to give you 100% compensation because it's in your best interest to get help and survive as much as possible, <laughs> rather than like slowly deteriorate because it like. <laughs> lowers the probability that you'll yeah. be able to like go and find help so to speak or maybe maybe and that's an interesting that, that uh, there are a lot of interesting questions about that right how how do you um 
um, you know, what um, uh, uh, kind of compensation uh, has evolution cooked into the system? Because that has been um, something that has been sort of selected for, right? Um, and uh, a lot of these things we, you know, as in the case of the visual system, a lot of the things we don't we don't really quite know and understand like why is it that a skate would have this type of visual system right um well maybe it's you know what it's it's good enough it does the job and that's what that's all that matters right um you know if if a visual system allows the animal to function well in its environment and survive and therefore procreate and 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 transmit their genes to to the, their progeny that's really you know all that matters yeah at the end of the day and so um it doesn't have to be perfect is it good enough mm. if it's good enough that's fine yeah <laughs> it's funny uh one of the uh things that got brought up in my conversation with Jeff Greensight, theoretical physicist mm -hmm. that I had on a couple of days ago, is this George Orwell quote about valuing <laughs> what's good enough versus what's perfect. So yeah. now I was drawing that connection to biology, it's interesting. <laughs> yeah, perfect, um, you know, people are married to perfect and I, I think they, they shouldn't be. I perfect, uh, uh, it's mostly an illusion really. Uh, I, I um, and it's sort of um, good, is is a lot of times much better than perfect right yeah. um because perfect always gives you an excuse ah, i don't want to do this until it's absolutely perfect mm. no no it's okay you know is it good enough it's good enough okay let's you know i'm not saying that means um uh, you know doing things halfway but um uh, perfect is not is not really always the the, the the thing to strive for. I think people opinion. make the mistake yeah. as well yeah. as like saying thinking their choices between good or perfect and yeah. not when they're actually they're actually their choices between like good and the pursuit of perfect. Because perfect yeah. isn't attainable, you know? So it's <laughs> like you're either just choosing to constantly be in not. pursuit. Right. Or exactly. Content, right? Um yeah. And so it doesn't um I think um this 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 thing where people say I'm a perfectionist uh you know steer away from that right it doesn't um I, in, in my mind sometimes a perfection is doesn't achieve not nearly enough as, as, as somebody who who just wants to get things done <laughs> yeah not sure what university is but i remember seeing this study where they had like one group and it was like a group project in a pottery class and they had one group work on one pot yeah for like a whole semester so to speak and then another group it's like make as much pots as possible and by the end it's like <laughs> the group that was making a bunch of pots as possible made like 10 12 better than the one that just worked on one you know yeah yeah well you know <laughs> it kind of translates to a lot of things mm -hmm. actually so um it's a good it's a good lesson yeah well yeah. professor anastasov the last question i had for you and mm -hmm. i asked this to every guest at the end of our mm -hmm. conversation was if you were 20 years old at this current moment, what fields would you study and what problems would you aim to solve? Oh, that's a great question. Um, um, so if, if, if I was 20 and if I was going back, um, I would uh, just allow myself to, to uh, explore. Um, I would say, you know, you know that's, Knowing myself, I would probably be drawn to things that are in science, but I'm not 100% sure. I, I think, you know, I find parts of sort of economics and business very interesting. I find history very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a terrible artist, so I don't, <laughs> I don't think that would have been a pursuit, but I, 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 I love reading. I love sort of literature. So, um, that that could have been something i i think i probably the one thing that i would say is is um sort of stay stay curious and if you stay curious and allow yourself to have an open mind um then um you know the, the world is your oyster as they say yeah well professor anastasia it's been a pleasure thanks so much for for being on i really enjoyed our conversation my pleasure too, and thank you, Juan. That was that was that was fantastic. Thanks. Great.